Yes. That they're here, okay. Ted, and as soon as uh, I'm finished. Say when, Robert. It's a great pleasure to introduce Ted Nelson, who was first the creative force behind what was arguably the first rock musical, and still, as you'll see, a showman to the core. He is, of course, the coiner of the word hypertext and many other evocative terms and ideas. And I'm especially grateful to him for making me see its potential, not just for technical documentation, which I was focused on when we re-met, but especially for changing education and scholarship. We worked together in 67 and 68 on the hypertext editing system with my students, and I have to say it was always interesting always intense and hyper frenetic. He's well known to most of you for computer lib dream machines and that was one of the very first books that tried to make ordinary folks understand the magic of computers and everything that they would be able to do for us. Even today it makes for entertaining and insightful reading. He's also the coiner of an aphorism that I've really enjoyed mentioning all these years which is that if computers are the wave of the future, then surely displays are the surfboards. And computer graphics being my profession, I've practiced that. Most recently, and actually for multiple decades, he is the prophet of Xanadu and its implications for writing, communication, commerce, intellectual property rights, and a number of other things that he will be addressing today. Ted? Welcome back. It is a great pleasure to be here today. On the other end, uh, 30 years ago, I had the extremely unpleasant experience of going to graduate school at a place I liked very much, which is Harvard. And uh, I loved the quality of the institution and hated the character of graduate school because <clears throat> it wasn't like going to college where ideas were your metier, where ideas were the substance of what you were doing. Rather, it was a, uh, a kind of um, serfdom in an, a complex academic structure of obligations and annoyances that had very little to do with learning. Well, this was a lesson. Education is a complex business. You have to make your own education by whatever means. They give you a curriculum. And what you have to do is you have to take that curriculum and twist it to make it yours. Now, there's always a paradigm confrontation when I talk to most audiences because the viewpoints tend to be so very different, mine and everyone else's. This, however, in this present circumstance is especially peculiar because the audience at this conference is so distinguished. The, it's hard to distinguish the audience from the speakers. Some are on the, some are on the, uh, on the list of speakers, but there are many eminent persons out there. And of course, we have this marvelous array of uh, video equipment infallible stuff. <laughs> and so here, buoyed by the new technology, we can talk about things and in a spirit common to the what we all feel about the media world of the future and how it should be. And so among you colleagues, I feel a little different because I've been at war with the world all my life. And yet amongst you guys, some of whom I feel our deep friends, and some of whom I feel some, have felt some enmity toward, uh, yet I feel this is a spiritual home, and I can say what I really mean for a change and not have to say it slowly. <laughs> so the paradigm confrontation ordinary to uh, most discussions is 
But let, let's, let's back up. Tom Kuhn coined the term, or, or popularized the term paradigm, to mean the, uh, the overarching system of ideas in which we live. And over the years, with the incredible difficulties I've had communicating to people, and I'm <clears throat> not too bad with words, and so the, there was something deeper here. So what, why is it so hard to get these ideas across, these very simple ideas? In 1960, in an epiphany, which would be technically called a psychotic fugue, uh, I realized that we were coming to what is now called a media convergence, that we would, that the future of person kind would be on the, at the computer screen, that all our work and all our creative activity virtually would be virtually at the computer screen, and that the different media would fuse into a new combination of movie and interactive thingamabob, which we didn't have a name for, and yet this would also be our new literature, literature being defined as that collection of connected materials which passes on to posterity, the connected documents of the world. And if we extend those documents to all sorts of media objects, then that would be the new literature. And it obviously was my job to design it. I'd been trained for it all my life and not known it. See, on, I, I had a peculiar background. I was, I was, I was raised as a, uh, by my grandparents in Greenwich Village. My parents were distant figures in the theater. They were divorced before I was born. And um, my father uh, was, was unique in that he had a hit on Broadway while he was a pilot instructor in Georgia and then went on to be an early director in television. And uh, so I got to be on TV. I got to read for theatrical parts and, <coughs> and be in summer stock with uh, some major actors when I, uh, before I was even in college. And at the same time, um, I was very theoretical. My profoundest memory of childhood took place when I was either four or five. I know that because it was in Lincoln Park in Chicago. I was riding with my grandparents in a rowboat. My grandfather was rowing. My gr grandmother with her high heels was in the front. And I was in the back trailing my hand in the water. And understanding and expressing things in words had always been the center of my being. Uh, a, a very good thing for me was that, that people appreciated my ability to put, into words, put things into words from an early age. And so I saw the problem of expression not as pleasing people, but as seeing correctly and formulating correctly. And so as I trailed my hand in the cool water on that day in Lincoln Park 50 odd years ago, I sensed the water moving around my fingers and studied in my mind the complexity of that pattern of motion. And while I didn't know words like particle, parameter, specification, Yet I thought about the complexity of expressing that system of movement, that hand shape, that glove shaped system of water and its motions around my fingers. And the fact that each particle of water every instant was, that the entire situation every instant was almost identical with the entire situation in the previous instant and how hard this was to express. And as I thought of each layer of complication of this moving structure, I recognized it as one more move, one more remove of expressive complication. And my mind, my little mind was boggled. And I was in awe of the expressive complexity of this tiny universe of moving water, glove-shaped moving water, compared to which, of course, the larger world was humongously larger, and compared to which the imaginable universe and all the stars, and I was somewhat versed in astronomy by then, was immensely larger, and I was awestruck by the conceptual complexity and the expressive complexity and the magnificence 
of the universe and the immensity of the expressive of the expressive problem in expressing this universe. So that was how I felt about things when I was four or five. And this problem has stayed with me. This has been my problem. The central problem is how do you express complicated things? And how do you see them? And how do you say them? And what are they? And of course this is the problem of science, this is the problem of art, this is the problem of computer graphics, this is the problem of software design. This is the problem, isn't it? So it was a, I, I was off to a good start, I think. And I really screwed it up later, but... Um, <laughs> so on the one hand, I was intensely into theatrical and media forms. I loved my comics. By the time I was 10, my com I, I, you know, I was a well-to-do middle-class child, and by the time I was 10, I had perhaps a four-foot stack of comics. And I remember the day my grandfather threw them out. He waited till my grandmother was away, because she would have turned them out. And I said, no, no, they'll be valuable someday. And he scoffed. My present estimate was be that it, they would be worth at least $300,000 at this point. I had Ha Ha number one. I had a complete run of little Lulu. You know, anyway, great stuff. <clears throat> and I could tell you about any of those comics. I didn't like the, the violent stuff, but, but uh, there were a lot of elegant things. And I, I studied the wordings. I studied the pictures. I studied the printing process. I loved magazines. I loved radio. Radio was so big then. And, and radio was so different as a medium because the, sa the family would sit around the radio and listen, and we would look each o at each other when good things or, or exciting things happened. In fact, I remember, I remember Pearl Harbor. I was sitting on my grandfather's lap and we were listening to the symphony, I believe, when the word came through and I remember my grandfather breaking down and weeping. And I remember the virtual end of World War II because I was listening to the news. I had the radio on in my playroom at the farm when news of the Hiroshima bomb came through and I ran back to the house and explained it, I think quite accurately what I'd heard. And uh, I believe it was, that was only a few months after Vannevar Bush's article, as we may think, was published in the Atlantic Monthly, which I believe we read at the lunch table at the farm. My great-grandfather, Mr. Edmund Gale Jewett, was a, um, an ex-science teacher. It was he who instructed me on astronomy and evolution when I was small. And, uh, and he relished scientific articles, and I believe he read this to us at the table. Now, I'm not sure. It would have been he rather than my grandfather. And, uh, but the w this way of thinking was always so much with me, of being able to follow not just the exposition of a teacher, and I didn't like teachers very much, but being able to follow the thought processes of a researcher discovering something, as Bush points out in As We May Think. So this has always been with me, but of course, the very notion of understanding the process of dis discovery and the evolution of ideas and thought was very big to me. We had on our coffee table uh, a big picture book of Notebooks of Da Vinci, which I just loved. We went through them. Da Vinci and Shakespeare were like members of the family. And, uh, and so to me, you know, there was, there was no question of what the great issues of the world were. When I was a child, the great issues of the world were the creative process, the writing process, posterity. And um, I'll mention one other religious epiphany I had, which was when I was about 10 or 11. There was a movie my grandmother had told me about for years, and she loved it, and she had, uh, and, and, and it was re-released, so I could probably find out the exact date. And. Uh, she actually let me play hooky, and we went to Wanamaker's and had an elegant lunch, and then we went and saw not just the original, but the sequel as well, a double feature, King Kong and the Son of Kong. I have never been so awestruck in my life. It was the most religious experience I've ever had, because it was cinema at its greatest. It was adventure, It was, and it was idealism, Son of Kong, at least to me at that time was a far finer film <clears throat> because of course King Kong was just a 
poor old raging guy, but Son of Kong was an idealist. He was, he was an albino, and, and at the end, I forget what happens, it earth, it, there's an earthquake, his foot gets caught in a crevice, but he's drowned, and above the water, he is holding, not Fay Ray, but her sequel, safely. And so in, her, in, her, in his clenched fist, which is all you see of him at last, is the heroine. Well, that was fine stuff, and I just wept and wept. And uh, I, I took a long walk on the streets, just meditating, and I just felt a great compulsion to do something, to express the, what I felt about it. I finally, I, I browsed the fine at five and ten, and I remember finally spending my last, my only 15 cents for a bottle of red ink. Somehow the, being able to do something in red was going to I was going to express this feeling I felt that day. So, colored inks, stationery stores, office supply stores were where I hung out as a kid. I hated sports. Bookstores I loved. I would play hooky and go to foreign movies. When I was 13, a movie came out called R Rashomon. And I saw it three or four times. It played next door to us. And I was profoundly affected by the telling and retelling of the same stories, the same story over and over from different points of view. And if one thing ever said to me that we had to intercompare things, it was the movie Rashomon. So those, it, uh, just to cite a few things, those, those, are, those are things in the, my, my background that were where I was coming from, but I, I loved special effects. We all do, of course, but, but I was into them rather early. And when I was 15, what was it, 52, I had an American cinematographer's hand, handbook, which I read from cover to cover, and I was already budgeting low-budget low movies in my mind. I, I, w I was a member of a film society called Cinema 16. It was perfectly clear to me that, that anyone could make movies. One of my heroes was a guy named Norman McLaren, who, a, a, a Canadian cartoonist with the National Film Board of Canada who actually drew on the frames. He actually drew some soundtracks and got away with it. It's good stuff. Very cute. And uh, layered effects. I was fascinated by three dimensions from, from the time I was a kid. There was something called the True View, which was a 35 millimeter viewer, far better than the, than the uh, Viewmaster, which came in later. And, uh, and, and according to some Gresham's law of media, uh, knocked the Viewmaster out of the, uh, out of the business. And uh, then came three-dimensional movies. House of Wax was, wait, wait, I don't, I think House of Wax was the first one. And the real thrill to me was to go, the curtains parted, and here was a trailer that said, now is the time to put on your glasses. And this hand-drawn road, this carpet flung out to you in three dimensions. And who was it done by? It was done by Norman McLaren. So to me, the lone artist capable of doing anything if you just don't stand in his way. He was my hero, Da Vinci, and Cyrano de Bergerac, my other great hero, and, and uh, <coughs> the, uh, the ringing line, I, I, I should know the French, I didn't even, I, I didn't even know till recently that the original French play was in poetry, whereas of course the America, the English translation is rather uh, clunky. But the, but the, at the last, uh, but, but, but uh, Cyrano's lines like, I stand not high it may be, but alone. This matched my mood because I hated committees, I hated producers, I hated backers, I hated anybody who wanted to submit a plan. <laughs> submit a proposal, screw that. Uh, <laughs> to me, it's, uh, it, it, Cyrano's attitude was die rather than submit, and that was mine. So what I wanted in life was the equipment, and that was all. And I wanted to be left alone. I wanted nothing to do with committees. And every argument in high sc in, in grade school, we were supposed to learn democracy by having committee meetings. Well, it, all it all it convinced me was that was that kids, the other kids, were incredibly stupid because there were so many layers of complex conditionals that you had to understand, and, and they would fixate on one thing or the other, not get the whole picture. And I, I just grew sick of it. I, so. Um, at wanting to work alone was was the always the center of my being. There was a uh, we took you know the usual cooter press for preference test in high school. Is that, you know uh, the, uh, all these other kids would say, oh, I want to work with people. No, sir, no, I did not want to work with anybody. And this is the fundamental difference between my wonderful 
and very great stepfather, Douglas Engelbart, and myself, because he wanted to empower working groups, and I just wanted to be left alone and be given the equipment and basically to empower smart individuals and keep them from being dragged down by group stupidity. And the amazing thing is that our designs have converged to some degree, showing, I think, the fundamental validity of this whole approach. So, because there's something, certainly, it is certainly a fine thing to want to empower groups, and I'm, but I'm just I'm 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 laying it out from my point of view. I just wanted to get out from under. I hated school. It was one of the profound experiences of my life was at the at the, at the end of seventh grade, the end of my seventh grade. A certain uh, Mr. H sent me from the room one time too many. What he didn't know was that I had already sharpened a small screwdriver to stab him, and I came up behind him at basketball practice thought better of it and the next day when he sent me from the room he was out to break me the next time uh, he, no sir he sent me from the room one time too many and I just kept on going down the stairs and I refused to go back and that was a searing experience to me because on that walk home I basically decided the fundamental things that have governed my life ever since that most people are fools most authority is malignant God does not exist and everything is wrong and uh, those have been my guiding beliefs ever since and uh, I finally had to go back to school and it, it endured another four years. But, but then, then came college, which was like spring day. Because there, it wasn't that you had to do this and you had to do that, but you were free to explore and free to find out stuff. And all of the ideas of the world were laid out before you. And that was what I loved. And the fact that... Well, <clears throat> I loved and believed in literature, but I didn't very much care for the literature professors where I was. And the social sciences were so much more interesting because here people were trying to say things precisely. They were trying to say precisely, what is it that makes the person tick? How does the mind work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very clear that all of the theories were true, except, in my opinion, Carl Jung, but that's another story. And, uh, and so essentially the real problem is how to merge true theories, not the silly notion that we want to find out which theories are false and do some sort of axiomatic division and find out it, it, it doesn't wash at all. Um, so I had a few fights with professors along those scores. And uh, my junior year in college, I wrote a paper in which I fused all of my philosophical concerns because I had since that time with my fingers in the water, et cetera, et cetera, I wanted to find out how to express things, how to say things, how to abstract things, how do we get the correct constructs, what did, how do you express dependencies and interlinkages? Think of the swirling around this finger affecting that sw finger. That's a linkage you need to express. And so I wrote this long, I think it was about 30, 40 pages, not, not very long, but paper and I called it schematics, systematics, normatics. And it was essentially a complete expression of everything I thought about everything in a very abstracted form. Uh, abstract constructs to a second or third level. I had a lisp-like notation uh, using asterisks in s and asterisks and parentheses, I think, and um, for expressing complex dependencies. And uh, some stuff on uh, the theory of strategy, I believe. A whole lot of stuff. I was very proud of it. I sent out a copies to about dozens of people, and no one ever said anything. But I, w I knew I was onto something. I had some encouragement from one person, Professor Michael Scriven, a very, very brilliant guy. Some called him arrogant. He was, he was my kind of guy. He just, he just said what he thought, and he said it very quickly. <laughs> so you had to be a good listener. <laughs> but he, he uh, definitely showed respect for what I was saying, even though most people couldn't follow it, he followed my every point. And so I knew I wasn't way off base. So I was torn between these two different careers. I made my first movie in college, I, made a, I cut an LP, I, uh, I uh, wrote plays, but I couldn't leave behind these powerful intellectual questions that, I, that, 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 that seethed within me. I, I, and, and, uh, and how to relate the problem 
of complex abstract construction to the world. So I graduated college in 1959. I was torn between these two areas. I had an interview with my father. and Our terms had gotten quite unfriendly. We rarely saw each other. And, and he asked whether I wanted to go into show business or academia, and I gave the wrong answer because he would have he would have set me up as an actor in Hollywood if I'd given the right answer. But no, 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 no. I said I want to do both, and 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 we hardly ever spoke again. And um, because I was torn, I I just I saw no reason to give up these two things I cared about. And then the next year in graduate school, I took a computer course. And while I had, there had been a conflict before between the one point of view, which was theoretical, and the other point of view, which was theatrical, abruptly, I got stereo. Because it was absolutely plain that this machine was a theater machine. It was the new proscenium of our new arts and at the same time what did computers deal with the press had lied everybody said computers dealt with numbers and this was nonsense they dealt with arbitrary constructs so that designing the arbitrary constructs which should be central to the media of the future was plainly the job for which I had trained 23 years. So I realized this was my true work and I'd be get that done in six months and go make my movies. And that was 35 nasty years ago. The first five was, 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 uh, was productive and uh, as the handout I've given you, which is my first paper from the ACM in 1965 shows. Basically, I'd done all my thinking then. I should have just died and, and come back as a, as a wraith now, and, and, and I'd be some kind of James Dean in the field. But unfortunately, I had the bad taste to live on and waste, entirely waste 30 years. So, uh, because I've, I've lived in a completely different software paradigm. Now, the interesting thing is, <coughs> first of all, I couldn't explain what I was doing to anybody except Deborah Stone, my now ex-wife was here today, but who's been wonderfully supportive all these years. She understood what I was trying to do, but when I would say to someone on the street, well, you see, what I'm trying to do is build a new literature in which you have automatic copyright handling by electronic means, since anyone is free to quote anybody else, but they're only referencing the original object, which is then taken out, and the royalty is paid on a prorated provide basis to the copyright holder on each frame, audio sample, or piece of text, arbitrary piece of text. If anybody sat through that during the 60s, they would blink a few times and, and then say, um, is it like a tape? And I was mystified by this answer because I, I, I never understood people. I know now that some people listen more slowly than others. And so, so when I talk, there's, a, there's an impedance mismatch because I generally talk fast and it's like trying to drive a high frequency at a heavy load. You know, impedance mismatch, impudence mismatch, whatever. The problem is that uh, you have to match up. I, I once took the Werner Earhart seminar. It was called uh, the Forum at the time. Really got my money's worth. And what he basically said is you have to prepare the listener. You can't simply demand that they understand you. And uh, I wish I'd known that years before. But then again, I never had very much regard for other people. And I never had a very high respect for other people's opinions, which is the only reason it was possible to think this much ahead because it didn't matter what they thought. So the same thing that, that the same ability that uh, to visualize that uh, allowed me to think ahead also very much made it impossible to get anything done. So the paradigm I lived in, I have lived in for 35 years, is that we would have new media objects of arbitrary dimensionality. I loved arbitrary dimensionality. I've been into, into n dimensions since I was a kid. Uh, so we'd have new, new media of arbitrary dimensionality which could be tacked together, stretched, and flipped at great speed with interfaces which I would visualize as being somewhere between a theremin and a bicycle. Now, a theremin, as you may or may not know, is a wonderful musical instrument devised by uh, a Russian count who was uh, a hero of Lenin's regime for a time. Um, the theremin you played in the air 
I think the right hand on the side was, was uh, uh, volume, and the, uh, the left hand above it was uh, pitch, and it was a simply an analog device with cross-modulation, so you had this eerie sound, which was again popular in 1950s scientific, uh, science fiction movies. But the idea that you didn't have to touch the thing, and that, that you just delicately shaded it. This I like, because, you know, the, having to be explicit and do things one soggy step at a time uh, was, was, was tedious. I wanted it to have a great kinesthetic sense. My bicycle, when I was a teenager, was very important to me because the great sense of swoop and turn you had was wonderful. And I believe that that kind of control is what you should have for your arbitrary travel through the new space of the media of the heart and mind. And so, creating this arbitrary space, as arbitrary spaces of new topologies has always concerned me. And the topology of the control space, which, which ought to match fairly well the, control, the, the topology of the construct logic that you're dealing with, would then be assigned to some aerial structure. And, and you ought to be able to get some exercise along the way. I wanted to stand, say, let's, let's say I'm alone in my office, but, but here are various airborne things, and I'm waving my hands in front of them, getting audio feedback, so you can hear virtual pages ripple or virtual levels uh, clatter. Uh, at the same time, you are doing, uh, you're doing a whole lot of other things. Uh, Steve Witham, who's in the audience, uh, and I once programmed a word processor, and we gave it sound effects that I'm surprised nobody else has yet. For, so the delete went, I can't quite do it anymore, but something like... And, uh, and, uh, and going up to paragraph mode and down to sentence mode, you can hear these things go ding, ding. And it was, uh, it's like a video game. The whole point is that you want as much feedback as possible. To, I am shocked and grieved that the video game industry has had so little effect upon the office um, software industry. The, the, um, the Xerox Park model has dominated uh, the office design. Now, let's put it, let, let me be plain about this. There are many people I like and respect from Xerox Park, and I like and respect much of their work, but overall, the institution pisses me off very much. I first spoke there in 1972. Alan showed me the, uh, the dino, uh, pardon me, the uh, small talk and stuff, and I was very impressed and thought it was wonderful, but I said, what about the lines that cross the boundaries of the windows? I don't remember the exact conversation, but I was very strong, I believe, already on that point, that you had to have pointing lines crossing the boundaries of the window, so that something in one window could explicitly point to something in another window. And they said, well, we'll get around to it. Well, that was 25 years ago, guys, and you haven't, and we're stuck with Mac windows and Windows windows and open look windows, and they're all the same. And if you say, which one do you like to me, that's, uh, do you want Del Monte ketchup or... Uh, or um, uh, a and P ketchup or uh, whatever ketchup on your cow patty. It's all the same thing, and attempting to cosmetize it, cosmeticize it differently with, uh, with, with, with slightly variant looks when you should be doing something entirely different, uh, it really takes me off. Uh, so that the, uh, another aspect of that was that on my first visit to Xerox Park, some guy followed me from room to room saying, I pity you, Nelson, I pity you. <laughs> and uh, that left a very, a very poor impression to me. So, so, so uh, <laughs> I always felt those people were entirely too pompous. The, the, the uh, uh, Xerox public relations would have you believe that Xerox Park was this happy playground uh, where, where, uh, where all these, uh, these, these, these sweet guys uh, played in, in, in their sand pit. And in fact, it was a very nasty place in some ways. I felt the atmosphere was extremely unpleasant. I was there twice, and I sure didn't like it. And, uh, but anyway, this is sour grapes. Nobody ever backed me. And by the way, uh, the five million dollars that went into the Xanadu project from 88 to 92 was to XOC Incorporated, of which I was simply one of the major stockholders and not the, and, and a, a figurehead at Autodesk. So no one has ever backed my software. I've had two, count of, two programs ever done. Uh, one in, that is, to my satisfaction, which means every keystroke in the, in the state diagram. And that was, uh, that was in, uh, 92, no, uh, 79 was, was one of them, and uh, anyway, th in that area, the, the, the 70s. And the point is that my interfaces are completely different. For example, the, the, um, the word processor, JOT, or prose processor, I call it, the unit is the, uh, is the units are sentence, paragraph, what was it? Yeah, word, sentence, and paragraph. And, uh, and, and most of the operation is done with a space bar. You step forward through the through with the space bar, hopping over various characters. It's completely different from anything you know now. And um, 
I had sat wiggling my fingers in the dark with my eyes closed, designing it for some months. And um, I showed the state diagram to John Post and Mark Miller, who were going to implement it. And, um, and uh, John said to Mark, well, uh, this Ted's got some interesting ideas. I think we should fix this. Mark says, I know him better than you do. Let's do it his way first. And what I told them was, it's going to feel creamy smooth. You'll be able to edit text, and it will just feel very smooth and natural. And they could see nothing in the state di diagram that had anything to do with this. And to this day, Mark Miller is furious because it felt creamy, smooth, and natural, and he doesn't know why. And the answer is because it was designed according to a completely different paradigm. And, uh, and, it is, and I live in that paradigm, and you will see my software one day, and it won't be anything like, like anything you've ever seen. So, uh, the one thing I've concentrated on, well, I, there were ma three major thrusts. I, I, worked, I was working uh, on uh, text systems from the very beginning. I put in a patent application for, um, uh, for image synthesis in 19... 69. It was late in the game, but then I realized that what I was up against, and everybody and his brother were doing that, so I dropped out of that area. And, uh, and interfaces, which, uh, uh, which, of which mine are totally different. So enough of that. Let me concentrate now on the most important stuff, because there's only one concept. I've narrowed it down further. There's just one thing I have to accomplish, and maybe it will have all been worthwhile. The objective of the Xanadu project was multifold, multifarious from the beginning. And in three months of frenetic thought in the fall of 1960, I worked out what the design of software should be. Now, you may ask why it was that I thought I could do this, and the answer is I was a... If you think I'm arrogant now, you should have seen me then. And um, <coughs> I had already, when I was doing, when I was doing uh, uh, magazines, I, I worked out how to do multicolor printing just, you know, on my own. And I'd just say this to the printer, would this work? And he said, oh, sure. And then when he finished putting it together, I showed him how it folded, and he was astounded because his oh sure had been vacuous conversational thing, and he didn't know what I was, what I was telling him. So, so I, I built up a certain confidence about how to, how to make layered effects. Layered effects to me were always the center. Traveling matte, technicolor, uh, uh, multi-gun uh, uh, color uh, uh, CRTs. That, that when, I, when I did my eighth grade paper on... Uh, on um, proposed method for color television, there was no such thing, although my father showed me the sets at CBS where they were already painted in color because they expected them to be. Uh, also at that time, layered sound, layered recordings were just beginning. Les Paul and Mary Ford, Lewis and B.B. Barron, who did the, um, who did the uh, soundtrack for Forbidden Planet, were right around the corner from where I lived. And so I had an intimate sense that, oh boy, layered effects are going to be the thing of the future, and it was very clear how this was done being done in analog. So the notion that a final effect, whether it's an illuminated manuscript or a Technicolor movie, is the focal result of a confluence of many different structures merged by someone who is thinking out the combined effect. This to me was central in the design of media. My heroes when I was a kid were, when I was 12 years old, my heroes were Buckminster Fuller, Orson Welles, Walt Disney, and Burton Russell. And so, uh, and the, the, the parallel to, to, to Orson Welles has been very painful because only recently when I've read his biography have I learned how closely our careers have been parallel. Start at the top and work your way down. Beca but the point is, if Orson had known it, he would have been the greatest software designer that ever happened because he truly understood media. Who understands media in our time? Is it laboratories with that word in their name? Perhaps not. Perhaps it is those, perhaps it is those who really understand how effects are put together. Not only, when Orson was 25, what had he done? I believe he had simultaneously three hits on Broadway, his own theater, and uh, he made he did a radio rec he did a radio show, which was the first and crucial experiment in mass disinformation, called the War of the Worlds. He did it wittingly, because of some very large lawsuits. He always claimed that he did not do it wittingly, but of course, if you listen to the recording, he says, "Ha ha, this was just our little joke." At the end, he knew perfectly well what he was doing, 
And so that he was 25. I believe when he was 26, he went to Hollywood. Did he go to film school? He became film school. What was his first project? Citizen Kane? That film which is regarded as the quintessential director's movie of all time. He understood everything that went into a film. And so, and then for the rest of his life, he went around with his suitcases full of projects unbacked, gradually piecing together his, uh, his uh, movies. That he was able to finish so much is, uh, is a wonder. Um, recently, his Othello was finally released. And I was ma amazed to discover that three women had played Desdemona, which is very interesting because in my first film I had to do retakes and the heroine was played by two different women and one of them, it was a great pleasure to me that nobody, could n nobody noticed. <coughs> so, this is what media are about. In my opinion, media are those channels by which information